okay? Tyler, I'm going to move today because the hour is late and, and, uh, and I want to share, I want to get a few things out to you guys. Uh, I'm going to, I told you I'm going to start doing this first season. I don't know how long I will do this, but I will continue to do this till the Lord releases me to stop. I'm going to read to you the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Congress shall not make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and petition together for the government and the redress of grievances. That is the First Amendment of uh, the United States Constitution. Amen? Uh, I want to talk to you today about do not lose heart. I want you to go with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move. This mystery that the Bible is talking about, this mystery that the Bible is talking about is you being a Gentile, Joel, being empowered to operate in authority. Now, this is what it's talking about. So I, I'm going to read it quick. I don't have time to theologically explain it all. But what this mystery he's talking about is for you as Gentiles being brought in as joint heirs, not only receiving the blessings of God, but also being brought in as joint heirs to legislate in authority. Okay. So how many see this suitcase up here? How many remember suitcases like this? I hated this suitcase. I preached revivals in this suitcase in the mid-80s. And uh, the wheels broke on it, and it won't even roll. I you tried to roll it down airports, and, and that, that broke. But, but the Lord laid on my heart, and he said, you'll either in this age, in this time, in this moment, in this season, you'll either have a suitcase in your hand or a sword. Let me say it again. You'll either carry a suitcase or you'll carry a sword. You will either take the theological disposition of some in the church that, listen, it's getting bad, so Jesus is about to come. And so I'll grab my suitcase and I'll wait at the airport gate for Jesus to come. Amen? Come on, come on. It's getting bad, and, and the rapture's coming any moment, so I'll just hold my suitcase, bless God, and I'll wait for that airport plane to land. Now, that's the... That's the theological disposition. Or you will take on the disposition that God's not coming back for a beat-up bride. God's not coming back for a bride that's got bruised eyes and a bloody nose and drugged through the mud and the, the, the wedding gown is all tore up and shattered up and dirty. God's not coming back for a beat-up bride, but God's coming back for a victorious bride. God's coming back for a church. Listen, God's coming back for a church that is on fire and they're ready to use their sword for the glory of God. Amen? They're ready to use a sword. Either you're going to walk around with a suitcase in your hand or you will walk around with a sword in your hand. Are you hearing what I'm talking about? Now I'm about to ready to cut the devil's head off. Glory to God. Amen? I'll be calm and I'll lay it down real quick. Glory to God. Amen. I didn't know that was a Scottish sword. Okay, so I want you to look with me at Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 6. I better move this suitcase out of the way before I kick it. Glory to God. And we're going to go, Sheldon, we've got to move quick, okay? Look at this. This, I'm reading verse 6, Caleb, because this is the mystery that the church are, we are heirs. We Gentiles have been brought in, not to receive blessings, but to legislate with authority. Let's go. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles and unsearchable, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now, everybody, I want you to camp out at verse 10 for just a moment. Because this is the mystery, that we as Gentiles have been brought in with the body, amen? But not just to be heirs of salvation, 
but to operate and legislate with authority. Now, I'm going to read it real slow, but I'm going to keep going on, okay? Watch this. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by who? Who's going to make this known? Who's going to make it known? That this manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Who are we going to make it known to? Who? It's going to be made known by the church to who? The principalities and the powers in heavenly places. That means there's going to be a spiritual battle going on and somewhere the church is going to grab a sword and they're going to rule with power and there's principalities and there's powers that are going to take a back seat and go, we can't do what we used to do any longer. We've been able to do this for a long time. But somebody is laying down a suitcase and somebody's picking up a sword. Amen? Okay, we got to keep going because of time. Okay, so praise the Lord. Just don't come up here and trip. All right, according to the eternal purpose, what is the purpose that Jesus has done? To cause us to be a legislative body of authority to make known this manifold wisdom to principalities and powers. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness. How do we make known this manifold wisdom? How do we make known to the principalities that they're defeated and we're going to just beat them down? How do we do this? We have boldness and access with confidence through him in faith. Amen? We can come boldly into his throne room of grace. Glory to God. Okay. Now look at the last verse. Therefore I ask you. Therefore I ask you what? Therefore, I ask you, because I have done this in you, because I have purposed you to operate in this authority, because you can legislate and you can make known to principalities and powers, therefore, I am asking you in this day and this age of riots, in this day and this age of turmoil, in this day and this age of quarantines and COVID, in this day and this age of discouragement and doubt and fear, I ask you to not lose heart. Amen? See, Paul was in prison back then, but today it's a different situation. But the church can still lose heart. Amen? Okay, real quick, we got to cook. We got to move. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Again, I want to talk to you something about this. I want to I talk to you. I want to I read this to you, and then I want to share a vision from an intercessor. A vision from an intercessor. Somebody sent me something this week, and they showed me a vision of an intercessor prayer warrior praying for our nation. First, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against what? But against what? Principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Where? In heavenly places. Say heavenly places. Say heavenly places. See, I'm going to battle in the spirit realm. I'm not going to battle in the physical realm. Right? So a young man, a, a young intercessor who's uh, uh, very close to Dutch Sheets and Chuck Pierce, a young man was praying in the last two weeks, and he fell asleep, and he had a vision. He had a dream, and in his dream, he was amazed that he could see himself in a cafe, and he, was, he saw himself, and he was eating breakfast or lunch with somebody. They, I think they had coffee. I'm not sure. But in the dream, as he saw himself sitting at a table, he was amazed that President Trump was sitting across from him, that he was having dinner with President Trump. Now, that's a pretty cool dream. I mean, I don't care who you are, you know. And so he's sitting there, and he's in this cafe, he's in this restaurant, he's having lunch or breakfast with the President of the United States. And in, in this moment that he's sitting there seeing this, then he goes into his body and he's looking at President Trump across the table and he goes, what must we do to save this country? Anybody thought that lately? Because this is a dream from an intercessor prayer warrior. And he's sitting across from the President of the United States and he says, what must we do to save this country? And the President of the United States paused and looked at him and said, we must protect and control the air. We must protect and we must have control over the air. I, I was 
I like history. I did not know this. I've, I've read big books on the Normandy invasion. I did not know this till the last month. But on, on Omaha Beach, a lot of you guys know that when the American forces hit Omaha Beach, within about an hour and a half, 5,000 men died. 5,000 American men died on the beaches of just Omaha Beach alone. There were three other beachheads that they were, two other beachheads that the United States Armed Forces were hitting. Uh, but Omaha Beach was the bloodiest when they ran right into the force of the German army on Omaha Beach. Uh, and uh, I didn't know this till about a month ago, but one of the boats that our armed forces were in that was basically shot up and captured, all of the American strategic plans for the next four weeks were in that boat, and the Germans captured it. I didn't know this. I didn't know this was even in history. But the Germans, Trey, knew exactly what we were going to do before we did it. They knew exactly what area that we were going to try to hit. So they began to set up and, okay, so that's why it was so bloody. Here, here, listen, do you know what caused us to break through? Do you know what caused us? We hit a battle-hardened German force in the hedge groves of France. And the only way that we were able to break through was because of a term called air supremacy or air superiority. And the big Tiger tanks, the most awesome, most fierce tanks in World War II, those Germans were moving up on the American lines. But what happened was, because we had air supremacy and we had air superiority, we blew them things to kingdom come. You hearing me? Because we were able to operate with air supremacy, we were able to win the battle. And this young man, this intercessor says, what must we do to save America? And the president says, we must have control of the air. Okay. Okay, here we go. Here we go. In 10 minutes. Everybody go to Ephesians. Thank you, brother. Everybody go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. I want to give you a few scriptures, and I'm going to read quick. I'm going to read quick. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. I want to talk about this thing, this dynamic in the Bible of heavenly places, okay? In fact, let me put it to you like this, if I can, Jesse, as quick as I can. How many of you know biblically there are three heavens? Anybody ever heard of that? There are three heavens biblically. There is the first heaven, and look at somebody and go, that's where we are. Okay, the, the terrestrial is the first heaven. Just follow, Kim, just follow through me. The first heaven is where we are. That's the first heaven, the, the, the terrestrial. Then the second heaven is where there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on. In fact, the second heaven is the spiritual realm, okay? And then there's a thing called the third heaven. That's where God dwells. Okay, you follow me? That's where the right hand, uh, uh, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father in the third heaven. First heaven is where we are. Second heaven is where the spiritual realm is. And then the third heaven is where God dwells. So I'm going to give you some verses about this. If you've never heard of this before, just strap in, buckle up, and go for the ride, okay? Because it's going to be a quick one, amen? Look at Ephesians 2, verse 2. In which you once walked, he's talking about living in sin, you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of what the air you see that where satan is where demons are they're operating in this second heaven and he says you once operated this according to the prince of the power of the air go with me very quickly to daniel chapter 10 verse 2 again i don't have time to explain it to you but daniel sees a revelation that the children of israel that have been in captivity for 70 years can be released when daniel sees that he does not throw a party he begins to begins to pray and fast he gets revelation that they're about to be released from captivity and he doesn't hate, say guys i got it let's have a big barbecue no he says we're going on a fast okay look what it says i just want to read this real quick to you hannah in those days i daniel was mourning how many weeks three a 21 day fast we could get into that but we're not now go to verse 12 for 21 days he's fasting for 21 days Laura he's praying 21 days he is battling in the heavenlies and on the 21st day he has a visitation from an angel of God okay look what it says then he said to me do not fear Daniel from the first day you set your heart to understand 
and to humble yourself before your God. Your words were what? From the very first day when you started your fast, when you started to pray, now where was his words heard from? Third heaven. God heard you pray. Where was he praying from? First heaven. Your words were heard from the very first, and I have come because of your word. Do you see? Because somebody was praying. Do you see that? Because somebody was battling. The angel says, I've come because you wouldn't stop. You see that? Go to the next verse, verse 13. Verse 13. I think we, there we go. Where is this at? Anybody reading that? Where, where's this at? Come on. Come on. He's praying on the first. It's being heard in the third. But where's the battle taking place? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me how many days? 21 days. During this whole time that you were in the first heaven, during this whole time that you were praying, there was a ba you didn't see it, you didn't know it, but there was a battle going on. There was a battle taking place in the second heaven. And this prince of Persia, this demonic hierarchy, this demonic principality was withstanding me until something happened. What? Behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king's of Persia you see the second heaven taking place here now real quick because of time I want you to go to uh, first Thessalonians chapter 4 17 talking about the second heaven we're talking about this this dynamic Frankie of heavenly places this dynamic listen if we're gonna see America saved we've got to get control of the air are you hearing me we're gonna see this nation saved if we're gonna see God move we got to get control. We've got to have air supremacy. Then, this is 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Where? <laughs> Woo! You see that? This whole dynamic of when we are brought forth, when we are brought up, we're going to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. Now go real quick because of time. I don't have time to comment. Go real quick to Revelation 9, 2. Revelation 9 2. Look at this. Look at this, what's going on. This is a dynamic. This is, in fact, in fact, uh, it, can you go to verse 1? Go to verse 1 first, if we can. I want to show you this dynamic of the second heaven. I want to show you a dynamic of what's going on. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from where? Where did it fall from? Where did it fall to? Are, are you beginning to notice that that which happens in the spirit realm has a major effect on the natural world? You seeing that? Uh, have you noticed that somebody down here is taking a hold of the altar and somebody down here is praying and while they're down here praying, it's going up there and something's happening up there and then guess what? Something gets sent back down here. In fact, Jesus taught it like this when the disciples said Jesus teaches how to pray. He said, pray like this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on what? This earth as it is in heaven. Okay. I saw a star falling from heaven to what the earth to him was given the key to the bottomless pit look what happened now demonic place is being opened up look at verse 2 and he opened up the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace so that the sun and the air were darkened there's that word again air so a demonic deluge is coming from a bottomless pit and where do they go up into the air do you see that Go to Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. Revelation 16, verse 17. Look at this. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into where? Where is this angel at? Where does he pour the bowl out at? He pulled it out, poured it out into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is is done this angel of heavenly pours out a bowl into the 
second heaven into the air. You see that? How are we going to save this nation? You got to get control of the air. You got to control the air. You got to control the air. Okay. So I want to show you a, a, a dynamic of intercessor, intercessory prayer. Okay. And, and uh, this is very interesting that Rachel Moore came up and said, I can't do it without you. Okay. Everybody go to, uh, go to uh, Exodus chapter uh, 17, verse 6. Exodus 17, verse 6. Now, everybody, you can read this while I'm talking. To save time, you can read this while I'm talking. Uh, in the Bible, we see that the children of Israel were in Rephidim. I'm not going to try to go. In fact, I looked up the word Rephidim. I'll just, this, I looked up the word Rephidim, Rephidim and it means a desert, okay? And then I started really trying to break it down because a lot of times when, Jose, when you read the Bible, if you see the city or you see where it occurred and you look up at the name, there's a lot of spiritual meaning in that. And I looked up the word Rephidim. That means a desert place. It's interesting, though, if you break the Hebrew word Rephidim down, it literally means the spreading of a sheet or a place of rest or a place of refreshing. Okay? So here they are at a spreading of a sheet, a place of refreshing, a place of rest and they don't have anything to drink and so the Bible tells us that Moses took a rod and he smote the rock and now real quick that's a typology of Jesus being smote for us in fact if you read it the Bible says that God said I will stand on the rock I will be on the rock and you will smite it and water will gush and water gushing is a top typology of salvation Jesus said you you're drinking water the woman at the well you're drinking water that will cause you to thirst again. But if you'll drink water from me, you'll never. Do you see that? And so it's a typology of refreshing and a typology of harvest. Now, this is interesting because just a few months ago, uh, they asked for one million people around the world to fast for an outpouring of God. Did you see that? And, and during there, when the fast was coming to an end, we were in a quarantine. And when the fast ended, this riot started. Is it an interesting? Now, go to the next verse real quick I, because of time. Go to the next verse. Go, da, 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 da. Go to the next verse. Go to the next verse. Okay. Now, I want you to see that. Do you know that Amalek's a typology of sin and the devil? And so as soon as the children of Israel got refreshing, as soon as the children got salvation, as soon as the children got water, that's when the devil wanted to attack. You see that? As soon as there was a refreshing, as soon as there was time for the waters to come forth, Amalek said, they're not getting that water in this desert. We're taking it from them. You see that? That's how the devil works. About the time that something really is going to happen and the blessings of God are really coming, the devil will do everything he can to attack. Is it not any different today? So I believe with all my heart, we have prayed and we have fasted and I thought that was good enough. <laughs> but it's time to fast some more. Amen? I didn't want to say that. Look at this. Now Amalek, Amalek came and fought with Israel. Keep going real quick. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Keep going. And Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. And so it was. Everybody say, so it was. So it was. Everybody say, so it was. So it was. So it was. That as Moses stood on the top of the hill with the rod of God in his hand, it is a symbol and it is a typology of intercessor, intercessory prayer. As Moses stood with that rod pointing towards the heaven, the Bible tells us that the children of Israel were beating Amalek in the battlefield down in the valley. They were beginning to prevail against the enemy. But while Moses was standing, his arms got tired. While Moses was standing, he was getting worried. This is a man that's over 80 years old. 
and he's been standing maybe for a few hours, Denise, with his hands up and that rod of God in his hand, but his hands are getting tired. There have been times, I'm just going to tell you right now, there have been times that some of you have said, let's pray for pastor. And so you come around me and you lay hands on me and you start praying. And I'm not going to kid you. I put my hands up and I'm going, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And after about four minutes, I'm going, okay, God, my hands are cut. Uh, all the blood's gone in my hand. I don't know a thing you're praying. I'm going, God, if I put my hand down now, I'm going to hit that woman in the head. God, help me keep my hand. Oh, God, help me keep my hands up. Amen? Moses' hands are lifted. The children of Israel prevailing. Moses' hands go down. What happens? This topology of the devil, this topology of sin starts overcoming. As soon as his hands go down, the enemy starts prevailing. So it was. Now go to the next verse. Now I want to say this because I don't have much time. To the intent that now is that the manifold wisdom of God would be revealed by the church to principalities and powers of the air. Therefore, what did Paul say to the church in Ephesus? Do not lose heart. Here Moses is a man of God, but he's just a man. The Bible says that his hands begin heavy. And he begins to drop his hands. Anybody been discouraged? Anybody been perplexed because of what's been going on in our country? Anybody said, I've been praying, I've been praying, I'm so discouraged, I just want to quit praying. When his hands were let down, listen, don't let your hands down. Don't quit praying. Don't you quit. Rachel comes up here and she says, I'm not here to babysit your kids. I'm here to disciple your children, but I cannot do it alone. Moses was standing on the mount alone, and his hands began to drop. And he'd try to raise them again, but they would come down again. And they could see that when his hands came down, when that rod of heaven, that rod of God came down, that the Amalek, the, the children of Amalek were prevailing. They were winning in the battle. And so all of a sudden, Aaron and Hur come running up, and they shove a rock under him and sit him down on a rock. And they, they come up next to him, and they lift his hands together. You know what that's a typology of? I'm not just going to expect one person in this church to pray. I'm not just going to expect one man or one woman to pray. I'm going to go and lift their hands. I'm going to pray with them. I'm going to come alongside and I'm going to pray. Because when his hands were lifted up, Amalek was defeated. Go to the next verse real quick. So Joshua did what? Defeated Amalek and his, and his people with the edge of the sword. Everybody go real quick to Revelation 5.8. I'm just leaving out a bunch of illustrations and stories and, you know. Look at this. Now, when he had taken the scroll, we're talking about prayer. Come on, look at somebody and said, he's talking about praying. Because, listen, we will be a, re we will be a place of hope. We will be a people of refuge. This church, in this season, we will be a place of hope and we will be a people of refuge. In this season, we will be a people of God's word. In this season, we will be a people that totally trust and rely on Jesus. And we will be a people of prayer. Look at this. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamp, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are what? We will pray till the bowl gets so full it begins to tip. We will pray till the bowl gets so full that bowl. Anybody, anybody, had, anybody ever filled up a glass too much and try to walk somewhere with it? Come on. Oh, everybody in here is smart but me because I do that. And I'm like, oh, crud, crud. And, and one of my kids or my wife will go, what's wrong? I'm, I'm spilling. And the more I try to, com try to take, you know, uh, just we will fill this bowl in the heavenlies with the prayers of the saints. Not the prayer of one, not the prayer of two, but the prayers of the saints till that bowl begins to tip. Come on, till that bowl begins to tip. Listen, I'm going to tell you what I believe with all my heart. Even though we're reading Revelation 5, 8, we're reading about a futuristic event, 
I'm telling you, I believe this with all my heart. There have been seasons and there have been times in the history of mankind that the church prayed until something was tipped. And when it began to be tipped, it was thrown down to heaven or from heaven down to earth. And when it hit this earth, earth, the power of God changed the very dynamic of our culture. And God's ready to do it again. How do we save America? We got to have control of the air. Okay, go to Revelation real quick because we got to close. Revelation chapter 8, verse 2 through 5. Brother Jim, then I'm going to close. I'm not going to give you any illustration or tell any story about me being a troublemaker. Look at this real quick. Watch this. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them there were given seven trumpets. And another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. Where is this happening? Third heaven. He stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with. What's happening? Somebody's down here praying. And somebody's filling something up there. You see that? This angel's coming before the altar of God. And he's got a censer. And with that censer of incense, he's also got the prayers of who? That he should offer it with the prayers of the th saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense which the prayers of this with the prayers of the saints ascended before who something was happening down here come on something was happening in helena montana that was affecting the third heaven where god dwells are you hearing this are you seeing this in fact the incense was getting so thick that god said i got to do something about this are you hearing this the incense was getting so thick, God in heaven said, something's got to be. Anybody been around a bunch of incense? Come on, you can't hardly breathe sometimes. Might smell good, but sure enough, you can't hardly breathe, can you? You got to open the door, open a window, throw a, throw a, a sensor to the earth. <laughs> Amen? And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Look at verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and he did what? I'm telling you, it's time to fill up some bowls. It's time to get air supremacy. Come on! It's time to get air supremacy. And it's time to see what happens in the heavenlies affect this earth where we're at. Glory to God. Don't watch the news. Paul McRoy. Come on. I, I, I'm going to say this to you, and I'm serious. If you watching the news discourages you so bad you can't pray, turn it off. Because we're not going to believe that report anyway. We're going to believe the report of the Lord. And we're going to have air supremacy. And the way we're going to do that is through faith. Amen? Okay. We're going to see the bowls of heaven filled up to where something's flung to this earth. Amen? I think that the, those prayers in heaven, somehow God begins to turn to fresh wine. Okay. I got one more place to read from. Go to Luke chapter 8. Luke 8. 18, I didn't mean eight, 18. See, God's anointed the church to reveal the manifold wisdom to the principalities and power of the air. Amen? Okay. This is Jesus, Luke 18. Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, and we're going to close. Okay? This is Jesus again. Last week, Kelly Sue, I taught on prayer. This is Jesus talking about prayer again. Are you hearing me? I want you to see this. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray. And what? Jesus is telling them, you got to pray, but you cannot get discouraged. Moses' hands are getting heavy. Come on! Don't you lose heart. Don't you you got to pray, and you cannot lose heart. Now let's look at this real quick, verse 2. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, hold on, let me just pause real quick. 
now we're getting back into this. Remember when I told you about the mystery of God in, in Ephesians chapter 3? Remember when I told you about the mystery of God, how it's the children of the Gentiles that are brought into Israel, and not only are we joint heirs, and not only do we get the blessings, but we're able to legislate as well? And here this woman is praying. Jesus is talking about prayer. But all of a sudden we see her step into a legislative authority. Okay, you see that? She's praying, but she's stepping into some legislative authority. In fact, Jesus would say, it's kind of like revealing the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities of the air. And who's going to do that? It'd be going to be known by the church. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. Now, have you ever gone to the hospital have you ever visited with a surgeon or a doctor have you ever been in a courtroom have you ever spoke with an attorney and you got bad news have you ever tried to do something or you tried at the hospital and the surgeon gave you bad news the 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 judge gave you bad news this judge looks at this woman and he says, Ma'am, I am tired of you coming in here every day. Get out of here, please. You think she left feeling good? You think she left unhappy? You think she might have been a little discouraged? You think maybe she might have wanted to lose heart? But what'd she do the next day? What'd she do the next day? Remember last week when I beat on that door? What'd she do the next day? She did not lose heart. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she do what? Weary me. She keeps coming, coming back, coming back coming back coming back she's operating in a judicial legislative authority and she keeps coming back there's some bowls in heaven that are getting filled up because she keeps coming back she's not discouraged no matter what the it looks like out there no matter what's being said on the news no matter what problems she just keeps coming and coming and coming she threw her suitcase away and she picked up her sword and she keeps coming and coming and coming back And because she is persistent and she will not stop, I'm going to do something. Look at the next verse. Stay there, buddy. You stay right there, buddy. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night? Will God not hear those that keep praying, Lord, save this country? Father, I'm not got, I don't have a suitcase in my hand waiting to get out of here. I got a sword in my hand, and I'm believing God's going to bring a third great awakening to this nation. I'm believing that there is going to be a harvest in the end time, even over this nation, like never before. More souls are going to come into this nation than any other time in American history because somebody's filling up some bowls in heaven. Amen? Shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night with him, though he bears long with them? Verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Stand with me all over this place. Are you going to rule, rule with a suitcase? Or are you going to rule with a sword? Huh? You gonna stand there? Hey Amen. Are we are we gonna stand there and sing "I'll Fly Away"? Amen. 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 Suitcase Christians waiting at the airport, waiting for the plane to come. Are we gonna lay that suitcase down, pick up a sword, and we gonna fill the bowls of heaven with the prayers of the saints till those bowls are literally flung down on this earth? And we see a move of God because I believe with all my heart we're in the greatest time we've ever lived. 
We cannot lose heart. Look at somebody say, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We're battling in a, we're battling in a heavenly realm. We're battling in a spiritual realm. I'm not losing heart. I'm not losing heart for physical healings for my family. I'm not losing heart. I'm not losing heart for relationships that are broken. I'm not losing heart. I'm not losing heart for the salvation of my children. I'm not losing heart for the salvation of my loved ones. I'm not going to lose heart. By golly, I'm going to make that judge so weary. Amen? I'm going to wear him out because I'm not going to lose heart. Father, give us, Lord, if what I've shared today, Lord, if it can motivate someone to pray. Father, if it can stir up someone to pray. Father, I, I, I declare and I speak, let it be. Lord, raise up a praying church. Raise up a church that will do warfare in the heavenlies. Lord, we must control the air. Lord, we must be a praying people that has air supremacy. Father, we pray that angels be released to do warfare in the air in the name of Jesus. Lord, change the air over Helena, Montana, over the capital city of Montana. Shift the atmosphere. Shift the air, God. Over the United States of America, over Washington, D.C. Shift the atmosphere. Shift the air, Lord God. Things that have been there for 200 years, Lord, let it be removed and be outplaced in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, you're raising up a people of prayer. We're going to fill up the censers till they splash out in Jesus' name. Father, I pray you encourage us to pray in the name of Jesus. Listen, I don't know what it looks like. I want to just say this to you. We didn't announce this. We had a lot of announcements today. I don't know what it looks like. But we announced last night. I didn't hear about it till last night. But this coming Thursday evening, there's going to be some kind of prayer and worship. And churches around this city are going to gather somewhere. I do. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Where is it going to be? They what? Well, that's a problem now, isn't it? Keep watching on Facebook. I don't have Facebook. Somebody, somebody's got to tell me. Amen? I'm old. I don't, I don't look at Facebook. Or, or, what is that? It's, it's my space and Spacebook. Spacebook and my face. Okay? Just ask somebody that knows all about Twitter. And they'll, they'll, they'll tell you how to pray. They'll tell you where we're going to pray at. Amen? Just, like I said, go to my face and Facebook, and they'll tell you. Okay? We're going to pray. I want to open these altars up right now. We're, I know we're dismissing, but if you need special prayer, I, I want you to come down to these altars. We're opening these altars up, okay? We're going to do this every Sunday. We don't want to just close the altars at church. Amen? We want our altars to be open. Praise God. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Father, just pray together with me. Father... Lord, stir us up to pray. Stir us up to pray. I'm not going to faint. I'm not going to lose heart. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to pray in Jesus' name. I pray every one of us be known in heaven and feared in hell. Amen? Now I want you to shake somebody's neck and I want you to hug their hand. Glory to God. If you need special prayer, come down. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.